Hello, 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 coaches and leaders. We are going to have a really interesting conversation, Scott Robley and I, um, about crucial conversations and how human beings, how adults can have um, conversations about stuff that can feel really tough to have. So before we dive in, Scott and I were like geeking out before we started recording. <laughs> so we are going to have, I know we're going to have an amazing conversation. Um, before we dive in, I first of all wanted to welcome you to the show, Scott. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> so um, before we dive in, I would love you to share with everyone, what has been your journey that has led you to what you do now? Uh, thank you. It's it's not a very typical journey, but it's my journey. Uh, so I started off uh, in education. I've known from a very early age that I wanted to teach. And so got a degree in elementary education, uh, decided actually to go a different route, didn't go the uh, public route, went the private sector and actually was a religious educator for 20 years and administrator. Uh, did that and decided it was time to go do something different, went off and did some stuff for a software company, which was a, an interesting but pivotal part of my career. Ended up then uh, moving into Franklin Covey. I was a contract trainer with Franklin Covey for uh, a good three years. I was I think I was certified in 17 areas of their content. Um, but uh, I have a wife that doesn't really like the 1099 contract world. Uh, and so we needed to, we were living out in North Carolina at the time. We moved back here to Utah where I live now. And that's where I was just fortunate enough to find my home and feel like Crucial Learning is absolutely my home. Uh, I'm now the director of professional services uh, and one of our senior master trainers here at uh, Crucial Crucial Learning. Uh, so that means I get to do a whole lot of stuff. And, uh, and a lot of that stuff is in the education world. I love when I get to bring uh, the content that we do, help people be better. That's that's our mission. Our mission is we believe that all we want to help people be great at being human. And we get to bring that and help people improve in the world of education where the impact is so great. I feel pretty fortunate. I love what you just said. We want to help people be great at being human. The type of coaching that I do is called human centered coaching. And I, I, we, we want to, um, we want to get, get stuff done through people's humanity and not around it. And Amen. I, I love that you said that. That's really great. Helping people be great humans. Okay. So, um, Let's dive in because we have a lot like Crucial Conversations is super meaty. The book is super meaty. It's one of those that you want to like take lots of notes. It is a dense, it's not thick, but it's dense. Oh, it's full. Right? It's a full, yeah. it's full. It's yeah, it's yeah. it's a full, it's a full menu. Yeah, it is. So um, before, before we dive into like how to have Crucial Conversations, I first want to talk about what is a Crucial Conversation, right? All conversations aren't crucial. So what, what makes a crucial or a conversation crucial? Uh, excellent. Great, great question. You know, after 30 years plus of, of social science research that this content is based in, we've learned a lot of things. And one of the things that we've learned is that there are certain moments in our day that have what we call disproportionate influence. Now, it, what's interesting is when you talk about crucial conversations, it's really not a book about communication or conversation. It's about results. And, and we know that in order to get the results that we want, communication plays a very crucial role, pun intended. And so how we have those conversations, how we step up to those conversations. So in those crucial moments, we often say that whenever you're feeling stuck, meaning you're not getting the results that you want, or you've got damaged or struggling relationships, there's usually a crucial conversation that you're either not having or not having very well. And what makes a conversation crucial are three things. Number one, high stakes. When stakes are high, and let's let's be real, I don't know if there's a higher stake in, in education. Uh, in terms of the education of our future, our, uh, the, our young people, pretty high stakes. You add to high stakes opposing opinions. And let's also be real. There more, there's no there's no industry that has more opinions on how to raise and influence and teach children and young than in education. So we've got high stakes and we've got opposing opinions. And then the third component, it's like a triangle. That third component, strong emotion. When you add strong emotion, man, you've got a crucial conversation. And what's interesting, you know, in a traditional like corporate world, you know, what percentage of, of a daily, uh, weekly conversations are crucial? I don't know, 10 to 15% on a bad day. But in education, it mm -hmm. feels like every conversation is crucial, high stakes, opposing opinions, strong emotions. So there is definitely a need to infuse skills that help us deal with those crucial moments that if we can navigate those, 
will have a disproportionate influence on the results that we're trying to get. And the kinds of results we're talking about here, I'm just they're like kind of flying in my face as, you know, we're talking about teacher retention, right? And like re return on investment, you're, you, you said return on expectations, uh, which I love that term, but like thinking about on average, it costs, I think it's $20,000 to replace a teacher. You know, th Thinking about like, you know, you get trained in crucial conversations, you could raise your teacher retention, right? There's all sorts of, there's there's student outcomes that, that get improved, right? School culture becomes more cohesive. We have happier, more productive teachers. So anyway, I just, I'm, I'm thinking about all the results that, that can be produced from learning these skills. And it's just kind of, like, this is just a lot. Yeah. And, you know, and do you think about that, if, you know, to our listeners, I just challenge you to think about what are the opposite, what are the challenges you're trying to overcome? What are the things mm -hmm. that you're trying to do? And then mm -hmm. I, then I'll ask yourself, how many of those are going to be solved without mm -hmm. the ability to talk about them? Right. Zero. There's not right. a single one. I don't care what you're trying to accomplish. If you don't have an ability to talk, whether they have to do with parents and teachers, whether they have to do a teacher and teacher, whether you're trying to speak to your administrators about your concerns, whether as administrators, you're trying to get teachers to do the things that they need to do. I mean, it doesn't matter. None of our life's problems will be solved without the ability to talk about. Them. Yep. Agreed. Oh, I love this. Okay. So Moving into crucial conversations, I would love you to share what are, you know, you've been working, you've worked with a bunch of schools over the years. What are some examples of um, situations that people have had to have crucial conversations? That's a really, you know, th there are so many. I mean, I'd almost be like, what what would not be? Uh, you know, <laughs> again, you think about those, you think about those, those three components, high stakes, opposing opinion, strong emotions. You know, what's interesting is I've been removed from the educational world for, for, for quite a while now in terms of like being in it. We support it, we're not. But my wife actually serves as a student advocate at our local high school. And, and so I get to hear a lot of the stories and, and that she brings home and a lot of the, the things that she's dealing with. And, and it, it, it really varies uh, from, you know, a, a counselor trying to work with a teacher who's trying to help a student. And when they don't see eye to eye, and that's, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we face is in, the, is in these opposing opinions, what you think is the right result or the best course of action to help a student is not necessarily what the other person. So from counselors dealing with teachers, advocates trying to work with parents, and parents have a different perspective and opinion about what and how their children should be served. And, and so there's, it, there's so many, and it seems like some of the, some of the most common really are internal. It's like, how do we as teachers build, build this, that realize we're on the same team and how do we help each other and support each other? Uh, so a lot of internal uh, conversations, peer to peer. And it, and it, what's interesting is it's, it's top down, it's top up. How do you speak truth to authority? How do you speak truth when you see it differently, when policies and procedures are coming, new ways of doing things are constant. I mean, I would, I don't know how well I would survive in the world of education today, because how we did it back then is not how we do it today and how we're going to do it tomorrow will also be different. So adjusting to helping people make changes, adjusting to um, how we how we deal with a whole new level of of youth i mean covid did a, did a number on our young people in terms of how they show up at school. And, and, and that's forced our teachers to have to be a little different. And so those are some pretty important conversations. And if you can step up to those and, um, you know, the challenge becomes um, that with these difficult conversations is how do we help people feel safe to hear yeah. our message? We, you yeah, know, yeah. we often say that it's not the difficulty of the message that matters. It's how safe you can help the other person feel uh, to hear the message. I was literally thinking about the two elements needed to create a safe, uh, safe conversation, mutual respect and mutual purpose. And, um, and I have other language that's outside the book and that creates mutual engagement. I love it. I love and, it. That's and, really the goal, right. right? Yeah, the goal is mutual engagement, which um, often is called buy-in, creating buy-in. But I, I love mutual engagement because it's mutuality. Instead, if I'm going to have you buy into the change I've decided, right? There's kind of a unidirectional. I may, I've decided something. I'm going to get you to buy in, which often, honestly, happens in schools because decisions are made up top. Um, and then I'm I'm going to kind of have you, you know 
want to do this thing that someone else has chosen. Yeah, but no, for sure. Yeah. But I mutual love, engagement is yeah, that's what it's all. I mean, for goal. us, it's not conversation for conversations. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. about action. So what yep. you know, yep. a, that's as we it, you'll notice in the book there we talk mm-hmm. about moving to action. Mm-hmm. Who does yep. what by when and how do we how do we how do we take this conversation and go do something about it? And I love the idea of mutually. What that mm-hmm. mutual yes, we in this together. Yeah. So okay, so I, I want to dive in. <laughs> We're talking about kind of examples of crucial conversations. What are the steps? Like the the book literally brings folks through step by step what you need to do to have a crucial conversation. So I'd love you to share with everyone, what are those steps? Yeah, great. And and there's there's a lot of meat to each one of these steps. But, you know, when you think about the the very first part of, of stepping up to, the, to a, a crucial conversation is to make sure we are bringing our very best self to that conversation. So number one, it starts with getting unstuck. It starts with making sure that we are recognizing where are we not getting the results that we want? Where do I need to have that conversation? And then making sure that we step up to the right conversation. You know, for many of us, we may feel like Bill Murray in Groundhog Day having the same conversations over and over and over again, and especially as parents. And so sometimes it's not them, it's us, you know, there, it's like a, it's like a a weed and there's a root to a weed. And if we don't, if we just mow over the top or we just pull off the top, we don't get to the root, the problem never goes away. So often, you know, when you think about, we use an an acronym CPR, content pattern and relationship. And so we often just want to speak to a content problem when, when a, a single instance, something happens. And then over time, if we don't speak to it, it becomes a pattern. And then if we don't speak to that, then pretty soon it comes to the relationship, you know? So then we have to ask ourselves, what is really the issue here? And if it's a relationship issue, that's what I need to speak to. We'll get to the content. You've come late to, to work five times in a row or what? But right now, I'm, I'm not sure that I can, I'm feeling I can trust you. So we want to make sure that number one, the first step is stepping up to the right conversation. Once we have that identified, the next is probably one of the most important and most powerful skills that people take away from the book or from our training. And it's the idea of mastering our stories. You yes. know, the, the biggest challenge and biggest barrier to having a good conversation is emotion. And so we have to understand where those emotions come from. And there is a very simple path to action. What happens is, and we all follow it, we see or hear something, we experience it, and instantly, we tell a story. We get into interpretation mode. We make assumptions. We puzzle. And unfortunately, that story creates a very powerful emotion. And then unfortunately, what do we do? We act on that emotion. And so the, the key is to master those stories, to recognize those are stories, and to kind of get behind them. I, I love to share the quote from the movie Christopher Robin, Winnie the Pooh, very profound. And in the movie, Winnie the Pooh says, to get where I'm going, I walk away from where I've been. It's like, whoa, deep thoughts from a stuffed bear. <laughs> to get where we want to go, to get to the results that we want, whatever we're seeking, we have to walk away from the stories that we're telling ourselves, that, that are creating the emotions. And it's not whether or not that story is true or not. That's not the point. It's about the emotion that it brings. And so you've got to learn to learn how to separate facts from stories, how to get yourself out of that emotion that the story tells. And then once you've done that, once you've mastered the story, now it's time to initiate the conversation. And there's a couple of really key factors. Number one, we always say start with heart. You know, the first thing that breaks down when emotion kicks in, it's not behavior. It's our motive. Our motive will change. We go from (laughs) wanting to make a difference to helping other people to, I want to be right and I'm going to win and I'm going to, you know, and and it just, it happens. And and so we've got to make sure we focus on what do we really want? And one of my favorite being in the world of education, looking at word differentiators, what do I really want? Not from them, but for them and for me. Because that that changes, that puts me in a different realm, a different. So I have to number one, make sure that I I know what I really want, and then I've got to be, I got to share it with them. I got one of the greatest ways we create safety, or at least to diffuse people from getting defensive or from misunderstanding what I'm trying is to share with them. This is my motive. Hey, Pekka, I want you to know that I'm not here to throw you into the bus. I'm not here to cause a problem. I would like to talk about how we can use the process that we've been asked to use in a more effective way. Oh, oh, that's my intent. 
I know what I really want for you, for me, for the school, for the, and I share it. I often refer to it as our leadership blinker. If we don't use our blinkers enough, then they don't know and they make assumptions that can cause some collisions along the, the way. And then once you've done that, a very simple framework, facts, story, ask. You start with facts. This is what I've noticed. This is what I've seen. These are the things that I've observed. Then you tell your story. People always say, but Scott, you just told me to master my story. Yeah, you can share it now because it's mastered. It's what it's your interpretation. Hey, I noticed that you came late a couple the last four times. I'm starting to wonder if maybe there's things going on in your life. Or the, that's my story. And then I ask for their insight. Give me their meaning. Can you help me understand what's going on? Now they have a, a framework. I will say this. When we talk about us initiating a conversation. One thing I always try to emphasize is there's only, we call it sharing our meaning because in the, in the middle of our model, if you remember in the book is a pool of shared meaning often maybe referred to as the group IQ. I want as much meaning in that pool as possible. So I tell people everything we do to share our meaning and to put in the pool is for one reason only. So that others will do the same. I'm not, I'm not trying to convince you. I'm not trying to convert you. I'm not trying to, I'm sharing my meaning. So you'll share yours. And if I do it effectively, then they'll reciprocate in kind. And that pool will get really full of meaning. And now we can have a really, really rich dialogue. That was a lot. That, that was a lot. And and you, you brought every, everyone through, right? Like you did the thing and that's like, just everyone listening. This is how, I mean, Scott just gave like the, just the, the, Reader's Digest version of, 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 and, and there's like so much, so much in each of these steps. Now, I want to, I want to ask you, which of these steps in your experience seems to be the hardest for folks to do well or even master? Yeah, that's, that's, it's interesting. That's, and I've had that question a bunch of times. And I, I, I obviously most people resonate with the master my stories. Mm -hmm. You know, I try not to be that father or husband at crucial conversations. You know, they'll often say, don't use your skills on me. Uh, but one thing that they do hear me say quite often is that's a story. That's mm -hmm. it. I think we are so entrenched. We are, mm -hmm. we live in storyland. And, and what happens is, for example, if we, we might tell ourselves a story all the time. If, if someone is interacting with us and they're aggressive and, and then they might, then you might say, man, you're really aggressive. Well, and they'll be like, they might go, no, I'm not. They get defensive. Or <laughs> even if they're open, they may say, what do you mean? Because what mm -hmm. does aggressive look like? It looks different for every single person. Yeah, now, we are so we're so convinced that that we know what it looks like. I've seen mm -hmm. what some when someone's aggressive that we marry them so much that that our our story in our mind becomes a fact. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. one of the hardest things to do is to separate facts from stories. And I have a really really cool example when I was teaching. Mm -hmm. So when I was teaching years ago, I had an administrator come to observe me, which we all love. We love it when they sit in the back of our class and give us feedback. Well, <laughs> what this administrator did is he took a, a half a sheet of piece of paper and he drew my classroom. And all he did is about every minute, he'd look at the clock and he put an X where I was standing. That's all he did. Mm -hmm. He did that for the whole class period. Mm -hmm. And then after the class, students were dismissed. He came up to me, he said, Scott, I thought you might like to see this and told me what, what he did. And he just showed me the piece of paper. I taught to one half of my class. There were X's on one side and no X's on the other. Now he could have said, Scott, you care more about the kids on this side than the others. He could have said, you know what? You teach to one half of your class. Mm -hmm. Those stories. And I could have gotten worked up. I could have been like, no, I, I get defensive. I couldn't. There were no emotion in facts. I looked at that piece of paper and went, holy cow. Fast mm -hmm. forward second period. He took the second half of the piece of paper and the top of the paper, he wrote teacher, student. At the bottom, he wrote teacher, student. And all he did throughout that class period was track questions. Who asked him, who answered him? Who asked it, who answered? That's all he did, just track it. End of class. Students were dismissed. He came to me and said, Scott, thought you'd like to see this? told me what he done, showed it to me. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. I was fun in the class. I was I answering all the questions. And he, mm -hmm. there were, think about all the stories he could have told me, his own interpretations. He didn't. He just said, here's what I saw. Here are the mm -hmm. facts. 
And man, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you what, from that point on, I am very mindful. That was, that was over 25 years ago. I am very mindful of where I stand when I train and teach. Mm -hmm. And I am very mindful of being patient and allowing other people to answer my questions before I just dive in simply mm -hmm. because he gave me fat. There was no story whatsoever. So mm -hmm. I would say the hardest thing is we get so entrenched in our stories that mm -hmm. we believe they are facts. And I have had debates with individuals. They will say, that is a fact. I saw it. They were mm -hmm. aggressive. But what did you see that mm -hmm. led you to believe that they were? That's the question. That's the question to help us separate. What did you see or hear see. Yeah. that helps you believe that that story was true? I love that. And I have my own framework in the whole educator called fire your complaints, F I R E. And it stands for facts, interpretation, reframe and empowering action or empowered action. And it's, it's very similar. And that's why I love the crucial conversations because it, it taught, and, and I actually grabbed the, the verbiage of what do you see in here for facts? And the way I, I also define facts is who, what, where, when, give me the who, what, where, when, what do you see in here? And folks still get confused. Like I saw, you know, she was lazy. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I hear that. Like people, well, did you see lazy? And I'm often saying, if I was a fly on the wall, they see me and I do this. I back up against it. If I was a fly on the wall, what would I see in here? And then, <laughs> you know, they, they try to get around it, but it's like, you know, if I was watching you on mute or, you know, what I'm not on mute, right. If I was just on the TV, what would I see in here? And so it's, it's really getting to that and separating all of those things we think are facts and that, that language. And I love that you said that. Cause I, that, in my experience, that is not only the, the most transformational piece, but also the hardest piece it really, it really, it really is. You know, my, my whole life, you know, people have always said to me, Scott, stop yelling. And I, and on a bad, on a good day, I'm like, I'm not yelling. I'm passionate. Okay. I'm excited yeah. on a bad day. I'm like, that's not yelling. You want to see yelling? I'll show you. <laughs> but again, that's the story. The story we tell ourselves some, Oh, you were, you were yelling. Uh, mm -hmm. You were, you know, no, what, maybe, you know, what does that even look like? What does it mean? Or why are you so upset? You know, those are the, we, I think the key um, we often say curiosity is key. Mm -hmm. So if we can, if we can be more curious, then we are critical. If right. we can be more curious, because behind our story is a, is another story. It's as a, as a different perspective, how I see it is maybe completely different than the way you are seeing things. And it's okay to, again, we master them so we don't bring emotion, but that doesn't mean we don't share our story. Because the story actually gives the context to the to the facts. If I was to say, hey, I noticed you did this, this, and this. And they say, yeah. And mm -hmm. well, it makes me wonder. This is the mm -hmm. story. Can you, oh, now we can have a conversation. So yeah, mm -hmm. mastering our stories, getting taking your, because emotion is what destroys all dialogue. Mm -hmm. I love that. You, you and I were talking before we started recording about, the the biggest thing that gets in the way of folks having crucial conversations and I want you to share with everyone because this is amazing this is this will change your life everyone <laughs> yeah you know there are a lot of barriers that can get in the way but you know what's what's interesting for me where where when I work with you know we work with all organizations all industries I'm grateful that because of my background I often get to go in and work with with school districts and things of that nature and in the academia world and what I'm learning over and over what I hear more and more and we say why are we not having it I mean it's not like everyone here is not going oh really I got to have conversations I got to everyone knows that everyone, yeah, I mean, yeah why are we not having it well one of the biggest barriers is that most organizations create what I affectionately call a culture culture of niceness. We are so not, and that is magnified in the education world because these are passionate, caring individuals who, who recognize that they're working with other passionate, caring individuals who are all aligned to accomplish the same amazing purpose, to change young people's lives, to position our future for better. And, and so what happens is we just say, well, I just want to be nice. And, and so I don't want to hurt people's feelings. And so what do I do? I don't say anything at all. That is probably, you know, we have two, we call it a style under stress. When emotion kicks in, we all have our own typical way that we respond. And it's not a personality trait. It's just a tendency. Mm -hmm. And some people have a tendency to withdraw, to move away. We call that silence, going to silence. 
Others have a more a tendency to move, to be a little more dominating, to be a little more controlling, to be a more aggressive. We call that verbal violence. And, and both pull us away from dialogue. But in the, to me, I mean, for the most part, most of our, of our educators, most in that space live in that culture of niceness, because what happens is we make what we affectionately call a fool's choice. And that fool's choice is we become blinded in that moment to the, to realize that, can I be candid and kind? Mm -hmm. Can I be truthful and respectful? Absolutely. But we live in this either or world. Either I can tell them the truth, hurt their feelings and damage the relationship, or I can say nothing at all. Either I can't. And so in that either or world, we make that fool's choice. You know what? I'm just not going to say anything at all, which, by the way, is not really true. What that means is I'm not going to say anything to you. Rather, I'm going to go talk to my peers. I'm going to go talk to somebody else. And we, we can, and man, that is just not, that's not helpful at all. Or yeah. someone's not picking up the slack. And so what am I, I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to go do the extra work. I'm going to go pick up the slack. And what does that right. do? Creates more animosity, more resentment, more burnout. Mm -hmm. All the, all the opposites of what, what, what we do instead of speaking up are so detrimental to the to purpose and what we're trying to accomplish. So yeah, overcoming the culture of niceness, we've got it. And by the way, uh, we always joke in our house, I was telling you, we have four boys and my wife will tell them how it is. And they'll say, mom, you're so mean. No, I'm not. I'm the only nice one because I'm the one telling you what no one else is going to mm -hmm. tell you. And you mm -hmm. should be grateful that I'm telling it to you. Mm -hmm. But Again, is there a right way to do it? Yes. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. we're just going to go tell people because we don't want to be not, we don't, we don't overcome not. No, you know, people, here's the reality. People don't get defensive by what you say. Mm -hmm. They get defensive by why they think you're saying it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, how we position, that's where we talk about that intention, sharing our intention, making sure they know the why. Leave. They may not like what they hear, but they're open to hearing it. And I, I want to put that that is something I very much highlight in a lot of my workshops uh, that people don't get defensive by what you say, but the content, but but why they think you're saying it. And I think the poignant piece of that is, is it, it's not, I'm going to say it, cause, uh, there's a piece that needs to be heard. It's not why you are saying it. It's why they think you are saying it. Uh, so exactly. it doesn't matter if you have good intentions. It does not matter if you have good intentions. It matters if they know your intentions. Uh, and so absolutely. <laughs> Years ago, my second son was getting married. And about two weeks before the wedding, my wife says, do you have a suit that fits you? Now, again, what did I hear? I heard you <laughs> fat. You know, and so years ago, and so again, she, her intentions were good. Her intentions yeah. were pure, but I heard you think I'm fat. You don't think I was suit that fits me. Yeah. So <laughs> excellent point. What it's what we, what they think, what I, you know, mm -hmm. great call out, great call out. Becca. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, speed of trust, which I know Scott, you love as well. Um, talks about we need to be part of building trust is we need to be transparent about our intentions. It really, and I I, I say this a lot, I'm going to say it's probably the fifth time just in this episode, which is it, it we need to be obvious and repetitive about why we are doing things and have our actions match up with what why, you know, what what are what we say our motives are, right? And, you know, uh, Brene Brown, you and I mentioned Brene Brown earlier, clear is kind, unclear is unkind. When we are walking around harboring frustration, resentment, anger, judgment um, on someone and pretending like it's not there and just being nice, that is unkind because people feel it. We are humans. We have these little like sensory things. We can sense when someone has some weird juju about them when they're around us. We might not be able to put the word to it, but we know something weird is in the space between us, whether or not it's said. You know, it's funny. You know, I mentioned a little earlier this idea of the leadership blinker. Um, I had a really powerful experience years ago in North Carolina uh, mm -hmm. with my with my third son, who was then 15 years old, learning how to drive. And it was Christmas Day, Becca, and we had gone to see a movie as a family. And after the movie, like all 15 year olds, his can I drive? Can I drive? Can I? And I'm like, you know. It's Christmas. There's not a lot of people on the road. Sure. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go ahead? And so if you can imagine this scene, we're in mom's minivan, 15 year olds driving. I'm in the passenger seat, baby brother in the car seat behind him, mom next to him and two older brothers in the back. We got the whole family. 
And while we're driving home, this 15-year-old son of ours demonstrated, he showed us, he proved that you can, it is possible, to make a left-hand turn without signaling. You do not have to signal to make a left-hand turn. And he demonstrated that ability at an intersection when the light turned yellow. So if you can imagine, he's going he's gonna to make this yellow light and he's going to turn left. And the oncoming car sees the same yellow light, thinks to themselves, what? I look clear, no indication of turning, and hits the gas. Becca, it was a Christmas miracle. Brakes were applied and uh, accident was averted. And my son learned something that day too, some sign language mm -hmm. from the mm -hmm. other car. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget, my son said, what's what's their problem? Um, You, uh -huh. yeah. you would be their problem <laughs> because you didn't indicate you were turning. They made an assumption based upon that. And, and again, that's that's what it's like stepping up to a conversation. It's like a, we're coming to an intersection and, and everyone's trying to make assumptions based upon each other. And if I'm not using that, but I'm not using transparency, I'm not declaring my intention, then they're going to guess. And I don't know about you, but in my world, people are terrible guessers. They yeah. never give me the benefit of the doubt. So I can't emphasize enough these, mm -hmm. the importance of that kind of transparency. But it starts with me knowing what I really want. I've got to be really clear on what I want for them. Again, not from them. Right. And I've got to share that. And I've got to share it often because they'll forget when emotions get strong. I lead a, right. I lead a small team, as I mentioned. And sometimes you got to give feedback that's not the kind of feedback you want to give to them. But mm -hmm. I, I can do it because why? Because I know what I want. And mm -hmm. they know what I want. I want for them to be the very best version of themselves. I yeah. want for them to make their biggest and best contributions. I want them to stand out and shine. I really mm -hmm. do. I and, and because of that, it makes it easier, not not pleasant, but easier to share some very difficult conversation, mm -hmm. very difficult kind of feedback. So I'm glad. Thank you for emphasizing that 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 candidness and kindness can mm -hmm. be can be coexistent. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Okay. This has been such a fun conversation uh, to have with you. And I feel like you and I could talk for hours more. I know we, this is awesome. <laughs> we do have to wrap up. So um, where can folks find you and crucial learning, you know, and, and the work that you do to learn more? Yeah, thank you. Probably the easiest place is to go to CrucialLearning.com. We have incredible resources. We even have an incredible YouTube channel. You can go to our YouTube channel. We've got great videos that show examples of, of what how to have conversations. Uh, but yeah, CrucialLearning.com is a great place to go. You can always look for me on, on LinkedIn as well. I'm getting better at using that. Uh, but yeah, a lot of different ways in which you connect. But biggest would just go to CrucialLearning.com. We have a ton of resources to help support you wherever you are as you're starting your own conversation journey. Journey. I love it. So thank you so much. Uh, this has been so great. And um, yeah, like I just keep doing the good work that you do. I, I'm, I'm just happy conversations. Uh, I'm grateful yeah. to have been a partner with you today. And I have a dream one day of crucial schools where one day we're really? teaching. One day we're teaching these skills to, to our young people. Why are we waiting to their old folks like me to learn how to have a conversation? But hey, who knows? One day, maybe that dream will come true. I love this crucial schools. All right. Well, thank you so much. <laughs>